committee. You're live. Thank you. This is Senate Finance, Wednesday, May 20th. And thank everybody for being here. We're going to take a, some more testimony. We did the walkthrough on 237 and 256. And those we're going to do the walkthrough on. Um, we went over the two bills yesterday from GovOps. This morning, Health and Welfare took testimony on the first one, which was titled, um, yeah, Educating Various People on Energy Standards, and that was just the vehicle. Um, it was the OPR bill. The Health and Welfare Committee has some concerns about the section that allows pharmacists to do some limited prescribing, and they want to take some more testimony on that. So I told them we wouldn't take any action until they had time enough to uh, take a look at it in more detail and perhaps come up for a um, with an amendment. Um, and how we'll deal with that, we'll decide then. But so we're going to pass that one over for the time being. Today, we're going back to the Economic Development Committee's bills. Um, I know I've expressed my concern to the committee about doing any kind of tax credits or expect tax credits essentially right now while we are looking at massive deficits um, until we see our way through and start dealing with recovery and see where we can best use our limited resources. But um, Senator Sorotkin wanted to give the um, administration who's been proposing these bills a chance to come talk to us, perhaps dissuade me, I have not spoken for any of you um, so we're going to start today with two, 237, and we have Josh Hannaford. And Josh, there you are. Okay, the floor is yours. Um, Madam Chair, if I could just... Uh, yes, send us rocking. I, I just sent, uh, I asked Legislative Council to do, uh, to do a section by section very short summary of the bill because it's they're long and there are varying provisions. And I know you sent out an email this morning to try and stay within finances. That's my work. intention. Okay, so in front of you, you'll have, or on the website, our website, finances website, or in your email, you'll see on this bill, there's a two and a half page bullet summary on the next bill, a one page summary. It may make it easier for people to follow just want to ah, okay. I am actually going to print mine out right now. Madam that Chair, I don't seem to have a copy of the S-237 summary from Senator Sorotkin. I'll oh, post it. Are you, are you in the I have planet? 56. Uh, Faith, are you in the committee uh, link when you sent to Senate Finance? Are you included there? I am not. Okay, I'll send it to you right now. Thank uh, you, I'll Faith post it. Faith, I sent it about uh, 15 or 20 minutes ago. Oh, it's yours, Ellen, not David's. Okay, I might have yep. it. But send Mr. Rock and send it again and I'll make sure I get it up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've got one under an email from Senator Sorokin. I sent two emails, Yeah. one right after the other. Okay. Uh, thanks to Ellen and David for pulling to this together on short order. Yeah, that. this will be this will be very helpful. Okay. So Josh, I think the floor is now yours again. Okay, thank you for, for the record. Uh, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. Um, thanks for hearing from us this afternoon. Um, my comments will be pretty brief. And then uh, Chris Cochran, who's the Director of Community Planning and Revitalization has a, a short um, presentation to go over a bit that uh, drills down into um, the parts of this bill that we wanted to talk to you about. Um, you know, I'm just going to say that 
right now we need every tool in the toolbox we, we can have um, to uh, recover and thrive um, from this pandemic and that the downtown and village tax credit program has been one of those programs all along that has helped reinvest in our own communities. Mm -hmm. And by adding the neighborhood development areas to that and providing a, an expansion, we think mm -hmm. this increased investment um, is needed. Um, it has a return on that investment in the form of increased property values and increased property revenue and taxes over time. And, you know, if, if, Folks are aware of the housing situation made even more challenging by um, the folks in homelessness that are being temporarily housed all across the state and the unsustainable nature of that. It, it provides even more reason to give property owners, folks that are gonna create rental housing, um, tools to do that and to do that in short order. And this is an effective way to do it in our view. And so we hope that the committee would continue to discuss this and think about um, this uh, investment um, as you look at and make tough decisions about, um, you know, other budgetary uh, concerns. But we, we don't feel it's time to sort of can this, um, this increase at this time. It, it makes uh, for a good investment that's needed now and into the future. So... Chris, are you ready to jump on here and kind of dive into the mechanics of this a little bit? Yeah, I'm here. And I'm sorry I can't share my screen. Uh, the internet in Calus is, is not what I'd want it to be, but I'm sure you're going to fix that. I'm hoping, if all goes well, I can share my screen. If, does Faith have what you'd like to show? Because she can. <laughs> um, she does. Can. And. Um, You let her know. Actually, the internet in Colchester is not what it needs to be to, to share his document. I can't pull it up. Chris, I'm hoping you can. Too many meetings. Hmm, have we lost Chris? I don't see him on the screen anymore. Hmm. We have lost Chris. He will okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to fill in here. Um, you know, as you know, the, the governor proposed a, you know, fairly significant increase in the downtown and village tax credit program this year. Chris is back with us. You're back. Okay. You're muted. Was this in the proposal he made yesterday? Or he's making today? No, this is the, he's he made this proposal before the session started. Okay. Hey, so Faith, is, it says is it in his present recovery proposal. The present recovery proposal is for corona relief money only. Um, and, and does not include this, but this it was part of the administration's proposal from you know the start of the legislature, building on you know a successful program um, and expanding it to neighborhood development areas to strengthen the neighborhoods around our downtown. Um, there, it, it, it you know little known fact in the midst of our affordable housing crisis and, and tremendous need there is. The latest uh, housing study in Vermont, there's more than 19,000 units of substandard housing in Vermont mm -hmm. that need reinvestment, that could be serving the very folks we need to serve the most. And at a tax credit, um, providing tax credits to them is a pretty efficient way. It returns and reinvests in ourselves, provides increased property tax value, is a pretty um, efficient way to, to leverage that and to gain more housing units. So. It, it, that, that fact hasn't changed. Um, and Chris, are you ready to kind of jump in and add on a little bit more? We're trying. Um, I can't share my screen. Uh, Faith said she can. So I'm hoping that will happen shortly. Yep, there it comes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Chris, is that what you're looking for? 
Yes, perfect. Can I just ask you to advance slides when they when they come? Yes, you may. Okay, perfect. My so first just, question is, where is that picture me know. from? That picture is in Shelburne. Shelburne, okay. It was a neighborhood development area project from probably about seven yeah, years ago. Affordable housing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here to talk to you about S-237, but also um, S, um, what's the other, the economic development bill, because part of the policy changes are in S-237. The funding for it is in the economic okay. development bill. Chris, I'm having some trouble hearing you. Um, is that any better? It could be, just be my internet. Uh, <laughs> it's a little better. All right, I'll lean in. Um, next slide, please. Um, as Josh mentioned, I'm the Director of Community Planning and Revitalization, and what we do is focus on creating strong and vital downtowns and village centers, creating these walkable areas that um, people like and enjoy. Next slide, <clears throat> please. Um, the kind of work we do, what we call it place-based economic development. Um, Vermont's walkable centers with their authentic feel and variety of employment and residential opportunities are attractive places for millennials, our young families and empty nesters who seek an interesting and safe place to hang out. And well, um, <clears throat> as we all kind of carefully begin to venture back out with our masks, uh, I do believe our downtowns and village centers will continue be, to be important. They have kind of been the hotbeds of investment, commerce, adaption and creativity for generations. Um, they define Vermont and its brand. And while online retail and COVID has not been terrific for our downtowns, I am confident they will come back stronger than ever. It will take time, there's no doubt. Um, and building owners and business owners will need some help to adapt, adapt to the next normal, um, which is why I think it makes some sense to support the proposed changes to the downtown and village center tax credits. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is uh, Bristol in the late 1980s, um, and when the downtown program, this is why the downtown program was created, many of our towns looked like this. Um, our communities were struggling. Uh, the state, the entire state of Vermont made the National Trust for Historic Preservation's most endangered historic places list. Uh, most of the downtown suffered from deteriorated buildings, vacant upper floors, and shuttered storefronts. Um, the rapid development on the outside of towns and shopping malls made matters worse. So this is why the tax credits were created. They were created in 1999. The program started at $300,000 per year and was limited just to downtowns. Since then, the program has grown significantly. Now it's at 2.6 million annually, and now designated village centers can qualify. Um, over the past 20 years, um, 370 projects have received over $30 million in tax credits to help bring existing buildings up to code and put underused or vacant buildings back into productive use. Conservatively, the program has leveraged over $800 million in outside investments to strengthen our community, our quality of life, our sense of place, our economy and brand. The proposed $1.4 million increase enables the program a program that's worked and proven effective to do more to support rental housing and flood resilience in our centers. Um, as I mentioned before, the tax credit policy changes are included in S-237, the funding increases in 256. And before things came to a grinding halt, House Commerce was strongly advocating for the tax credit. Um, our initial testimony in Ways and Means was quite favorable. And while COVID uh, certainly has changed the way we look at many things, I would argue that COVID makes uh, investments to keep our community strong, increase affordable housing options is even more important. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> and here's Bristol today. Um, as you see, it's a lot's changed. Um, I can't say the tax credits had everything to do with it. Um, but it certainly played a big part in fixing up these communities and, and restoring the vitality. Um, I ask, you know, when I look at Bristol before and after, 
Um, you know, which, which community do I want to come to? Which community do I want to visit? Which community do I want to raise a family in? And um, I think all of our downtowns have done tremendous work with these downtown tax credits. Um, next slide. Um, the chair's favorite building, of course, is the French blocks. Um, got a boost with um, the downtown and village center tax credits. That building had been vacant. Its upper floor is vacant since FDR was president. Uh, it's nice to see the lights on back there. Um, Brooks House in Brattleboro, um, Putnam oh. Block in um, <clears throat> Bennington. Um, governor is here last year in St. Johnsbury's. Um, um, with a big award for a, a project New Avenue Hotel in St. Johnsbury. Um, but those are some big projects, but it also happens as lots of small little projects. Um, a lot of our village stores um, get a boost with these tax credits to kind of make the improvement we need to keep open. Um, in my community, um, Callis, the Maple Corner Community Store has been a lifesaver um, trying to get supplies and food and, and drinks um, during the COVID outbreak. Next slide. Um, well, the work of our revitalizing our downtown and village centers will never quite be, be complete. Um, we've begun to turn our attention to the neighborhoods. And I think having more people living and working in our downtowns and villages is critical to keeping young Vermonters here and drawing new families and businesses to Vermont. I think the investments we make in more active and attractive community not only improves our quality of life, but it helps expand the tax base and make Vermont more affordable. And you know, despite the incredibly successful $37 million housing bond and the work of many partners to improve and increase the supply of affordable housing in Vermont, the gap between the need and the availability of housing stubbornly persists. COVID made that worse. Okay, Chris, I can't hear you at all. I'm sorry, it's probably my internet connection. No, um, I can hear you now. I think you just- as you, Yeah, you speak look, up. Looking down. Okay, I'll, I'll lean in more. Um, okay. So despite the, despite the uh, success of the housing bond and the work of many partners, um, there still remains a huge gap in the amount of affordable housing that we need. COVID has made that worse. And without a sustained and increased investment in housing, we're gonna continue to lose ground. Um, DHD and its partners also identified several permitting barriers that limit housing opportunities and choice in and around our downtowns and villages. And while these changes are not under the purview of the community, I think just some quick context on why they're important and how they support and ensure we get more bang for our buck um, makes some sense. So I just wanted to just take a moment to quickly set that up so you understand the, the policy rationale for why we're asking for the increase. Next slide. Um, part of the affordable housing challenge, the biggest part is always money. Um, but the other part is that many of our Vermont communities adopted kind of 60s and 70s style auto-oriented regulations. Um, this zoning favored single family homes for the types of households that are increasingly rare today. Um, the common characteristics of these regulations were excessive parking requirements, overly wide streets, large lots, deep and deep setbacks from the roads. As a result of this um, auto-oriented zoning, many of Vermont's traditional development areas our compact downtowns and neighborhoods are legal. You have to get a variance if you wanna add on to your historic building. Um, and even more vexing to me is several Vermont communities with suburban style zoning have minimum one and two acre residential lots within their sewer service area. While I'm sure there may be good reasons for this, it doesn't make a lot of economic sense given the high cost of maintaining these systems and the fact that the residents often complain about their high sewer and water bills. I think one of the ways to make these systems more affordable, reduce the cost of housing and make our communities more sustainable is to allow more smaller lots and more connections to these sewer and water systems. Next slide, please. This is what Vermont families look like today. Um, we're aging and family size has gotten a lot smaller. Um, and our existing housing supply or our large old buildings in our downtowns, our large suburban homes, it's not, it's, there's a mismatch between what 
Vermont families need and what we have built. Next slide. Um, communities across Vermont share our anxieties about our challenging, demo our changing demographics, shifts in our housing preference, funding constraints, and the hurdles to creating more affordable housing. Uh, but Vermont can do more to support workforce housing by aligning our state and local re regulations with new funding to create more and better housing opportunities close to where people work, go to school, or shop. Next slide. Um, this last summer, we did a quick survey of, of planning and developers and, and the affordable housing community and, and asked them, what are the most needed housing types in the state? Okay, um, Chris, I'm going to take a book from Senator McDonald's playbook and ask you, when you talk about affordable housing, you started out talking about the need for housing for the homeless population. When I first started in this, when the state didn't allow the city of Montpelier to size its water filtration plant for growth, um, affordable housing, they talked about worker housing. So when you're talking about affordable housing, can you define, are you talking about subsidized housing or are you talking about worker housing that your average working person or family could afford? Uh, all of the above. And I have a slide in a, in a few forward that kind of talk about what we're trying to do here. So if I could uh, answer your question with that slide. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. okay. So um, the, the proposed changes, um, modernization to regulations is, is going to help more middle income people um, find more affordable housing for them. And I'll show you a graph in a second, but um, quickly, it's a couple slides from now. The downtown and village center areas were, were noted as the, the areas where people really wanted to live um, because it was close to where they worked and they went to school. Next slide. Um, we asked them what the biggest barriers to housing was. Um, it's <clears throat> limited housing stock, limited land, Money. high construction cost, uh, reluctance to change, and uh, state and local regulations. Um, when you look at these four, um, many of them are related to regulations. And I'm um, sure. The lack of. Uh, uh, Sandra Pearson has a question. Yeah, I, I, I guess I don't know if others agree. And if I'm the only one, then that's fine. But I don't feel like I need the sales pitch. I, I would gladly support policies that get us more housing. I would really appreciate the question that you asked yesterday in, in the context of a $400 million budget shortfall is the governor and the administration still supportive of this and how do we uh afford it and and ra the value is really clear to me and yeah. um that to me though is the central question that we've got to wrestle with at this moment yeah um i, I, I don't want to speak for for josh but you know I, the administration you know the governor is a big advocate of the downtown and village center tax credits we've had um, an ongoing need for housing in and around our centers. Um, we don't really know what the federal funding is going to do for our budgets. We're kind of, you know, every, every week I feel like we get additional guidance for how the, the CARES money may be used. Um, and there's talk of a future funding package that would help balance local okay. and state budgets. So, Yes, we're supportive, but how we pay for it is a, is a little uncertain to me now. Um, it's very mm -hmm. fluid, and I hope that picture will get clearer in the coming months. Okay, uh, the dear, the guidelines we are working under at the moment. The one thing that has been consistently clear is that we cannot use COVID money to replace lost revenue. 
the budget deficits are due to lost revenue. So we may replace some of that if we have extra expenses, but we still are looking at hundreds of millions of dollars in lost revenue. A 17 cent property tax increase to cover the deficit in the Ed Fund, that's what that we're looking at, is not going to help anybody get, maintain, or buy housing. So where and I've never voted against a downtown bill. I voted for the original neighborhood bill. I've always voted for downtown tax credits. I wrote my master's thesis on downtown redevelopment. But this particular moment in time, the question is, what kind of commitments do we make with what little revenue we may. I don't think anyone's talking away with doing with, is it 2.6 or 2.9 million? 2 that we've got? Yeah, 2.6. But the proposal is to up that to 400 or to 4 million, not 400, 4 million. Um, that's the most significant increase that I've ever looked at. And so I think that's what the committee is struggling with. Nobody is arguing that I know of with the efficacy of investing in downtowns. It's if we invest in downtowns, what are we not going to be able to invest in right now? Yes, and sorry. So, I mean, that's, just where I am, Senator Campion. No, and I'm sorry to have interrupted, Madam Chair. I just, I just wanted to add uh, that I share the concern that you and Senator Pearson just outlined. Um, it seems just that the timing uh, of this, and it's, it's almost, I don't want to quite say wait and come back, but uh, it's a little bit how I'm feeling, wait until we really understand whether or not um, this is actually doable, given the circumstances that we're finding ourselves in. If the federal government comes through with additional aid that says we can use it to backfill, mm. then we can all breathe a sigh of relief. But the president this morning announced that the economy was open, everything was fine, and he saw no aid, no reason for additional aid to states. So that could change by tomorrow, but it's not guaranteed at this point. We also will be back here in the fall. We're only doing a budget for the first quarter. Um, we're just trying to close the books on this year and then we're coming back. So we don't have to do everything now. You know, there will be right. other opportunities in this biennium which may be the longest biennium in record, but um, so, we're not going home in a week and stay there. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, we're sort of drilling down on the on the one finance issue that's in this bill. Going okay, from I can't hear you. Huh. I don't know why it says I'm- Okay, you're better if you're closer to the mic. Okay, so we're drilling down on the one Finance Committee issue in this long bill, quite frankly, going from right. 2.6 2. to 4 million. And I think I may have mentioned to you before, one of the reasons why I think this is important, other parts of the bill that deal with policy, realistically open this program up to neighborhoods, like we're moving mm -hmm. out to 50 from neighborhood uh, development. So when people came to me from the administration and said, we want to do this and expand it to the to neighborhoods. I said I was all for it, but I was concerned that by expanding it to neighborhoods, we were going to dilute the 2.6 that could otherwise go to downtowns. And they made me feel a lot more comfortable. They originally said they were doubling the size of the program. They came in with a budget of four million. So that's my thinking. However, I fully understand the situation we're in. And 
uh, I'm wondering if maybe there, but I want to send uh, some highlight out there that we're expanding the scope and breadth of this program and thereby potentially diluting the help we can give to our downtowns uh, that if money becomes available, whether it's another bill or some other mechanism that we would like to see this program increase. So I don't know how we do this. I could perhaps work with legislative council for some contingent language. There's another appropriation section in this bill that deals with VHCB. That's there's contingent language there saying you get more money if the property transfer tax goes up and they're not going to get that money. So maybe there's a contingency language if people would otherwise support this that uh, would make it sure, right. at least as you say, in September, if we come back, there's a highlight on this program to put try and get more money for it. Right. I think, um, you know, there, if there's a lot of ifs, if more money, you know, if we find a way to fill the deficits so that we can support the, you know, the uh, safety net programs and everything else that's out there, including the present housing programs. Right. Um, you know, the, the increase, the downtown tax credit is kind of a, a capsule in itself. It can be added to any economic recovery bill. Um, and we can state, you know, that if money becomes available, that that would be at the top of the list. But I'm not even sure at this point till I know what the list is and I'm not pitting that against food stamps or some other program. Um, I don't know how we do it. Oh, we could. We don't know what, we could what ask, the list is gonna look like. We could ask for a report back on August yeah. 15th as to what the status of fundings is and what the administration's suggestion is for this added funding at that point. Uh, I'm with you. I mean, I understand we can't, the mm -hmm. option is not to, to do major increases in programs, but uh, uh, I've asked the department, they think there's a slow startup on the neighborhoods. So I'm still hopeful that the rest oh, of the- this will is a slow start. Um, so I'm still hopeful the rest of the bill will go forward with the policy changes and we can get some language in there to revisit the chance for an okay. increase. Uh, I'll leave it to you to work on that. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Chris, Chris, how, how, what is the status of the um, downtown tax credit? Do you expend them all every year? Yeah, there's usually, usually there's more than adequate demand um, and competition for the existing funds. Okay, what does it look like this year? Um, we just um, we just sent our announcement out just to check in with everybody to see if a lot of projects are, that we expected are coming in. Um, preliminary interest appears good, um, but you kind of don't you don't know what you have until the applications are due and they're due the first of July. Um, okay. We, we hosted a webinar um, last week to just re-engage and reconnect with folks. And there was, I think some 70 people came out to participate in that. Um, so that's a good sign that people are still looking to make improvements in their properties. They're still relying on this program to, to help them. But what that turns into in actual applications, you just don't know. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator McDonald. I can't see anybody, so you will have to holler. Um, we, I have always been reticent to support tax credits, which are basically paid for by revenue that's foregone. And um, I've always supported the downtown tax credits for some of the photographs that we looked at, showed uh, Bristol, for example, the second and third floor buildings that have been vacant for decades. Um, and those tax credits through banks and conservative investors have made progress along those lines. Um, I, 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 I applaud those members of the administration pushing this program. 
but you got a $400 million shortfall and you're asking us to forego, um, to increase that shortfall in revenues by having tax credits to do more stuff. Um, when that we've come up with a way to deal with that 400 million, whether it's whatever it is, that might be the time to talk about this. And you've given a spirited um, presentation today. I would, if you're gonna go on a road with it, you could leave the one, the first one from Shelburne and uh, maybe one or two others out of your example and get some from, from other towns. Um, Crystal was good. So, um, yeah, Bristol was good. Um, yeah. So was the, the one above the Mule Bar in, in Winooski, but uh, whatever. But that, that's, we are, we're digressing into um, a, yeah. a, a travel log here. We got $400 million to solve and more tax credits doesn't help us do that and probably isn't the time to do that. So thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there Madam has Chair. been discussion about putting a hold on all tax credits. So, um, so far, that hasn't gotten any any traction, but it's been thrown in. Okay. Madam Chair, I just wanted to, to comment that, you know, this isn't a hard push. This is to do exactly what you and Senator Sorokin just talked about. Keep it on the table. Okay. When you Good. come to your final numbers, and you're trying to figure out what's going to re-spark our economy and help people get going, consider this program. It has a 17 to 1 return. It brings housing online and invests in your small businesses on Main Street, you know, which are hurting mm -hmm. in a very efficient way compared to other programs that rely 100% on, you know, public support. This is a small percentage and is one of the few programs that helps private um, businesses and private uh, rental property owners reinvest and provide housing and services for, for Vermonters. That, that's all we're trying to make you're, sure this stays alive. You're preaching to the choir. I can show you Elm Street and Montpelier that three private investors tried to do. Um, and it wasn't until we did. Okay. I think Senator McDonald and I have been there since the beginning. Tax credits um, are public support. Please don't try are. and sell a program that doesn't and say it doesn't require public support it does. when you're using tax credits. You can Senator McDonald, that's not what I was suggesting. I was suggesting okay. that this one is a small sliver compared to some of the other publicly supported projects, right. and particularly in the uh, subsidized affordable housing world well, where those they, tax credits are 100% of the project, and this is a, a small percent. Right now, everything seems to be at risk. So we're trying to work our way through, not make commitments that would decrease revenue, which will then, you could end up with more cuts in, in other housing programs, which I don't think any of us want to do. So um, Chris, have you got anything else? Uh, this because we're only going to deal with the finance issues, which is yeah. revenue. Um, um, no, I mean, I I think we're all in the same place, and I think you know I, okay. I don't want to speak for the governor, but I, he's equally you know concerned about the budget, and um, you know we're all going to have to look at our priorities and see what's available. I think our interest is just to try to keep this in play. I think it's an important program. I think you must many of you agree. Um, I think our downtowns are going to have to, they need tools to figure out how they're going to adapt to a, a, a new environment. Um, many of our buildings may be empty for a while, and this may be the time that we want to figure out how we can support people making investments to adapt their building to, you know, a post-COVID environment. So um, I, I think we're all in a similar place there, and um, if that could be the way forward, that would be a terrific solution. Okay. And, and just one last, you know, pitch for the policy changes in here that actually reduce yeah. costs, you know, the Act 250 and so forth, where we don't need people that have been hurting to be paying double permitting fees and being paying a fee to redevelop the downtown, which is where we're telling them to go. So, you know, we hope those can keep moving because that'll save us money. I've been trying to get rid of the duplicate water hookup fees for 20 years or more. 
And, um, and you, if you could you finally do that. do that, that would be nice. That is in there, as you know. I know it is. <laughs> Focus <Okay>. on that. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm, I think at this point, unless any of the committee members have questions, I'm going to move us on to 256, um, which is the Employee Incentive Program. And again, I'm going to try to keep this focused on tax-related issues. We're not doing planning, zoning, any of those questions. Um, I'm not sure where it, this bill is going after this, but I'm trying to keep us focused. So I'm going to start with Mark Letourney. And Mark, you're here. You're from Westford. Oh, you're muted, Mark. We need you to unmute. No, you're still, no, there you go. Okay. You. Good afternoon, honorable senators. Uh, my name is Mark Letourney, and I serve on the Westford Planning Commission. And I really appreciate this opportunity to testify before you in support of project-based TIFs and the vital role this finance tool will play for a community like Westford in a revitalization of its village center. Um, I've lived and worked in Westford for 42 years, and I've served on various boards in various capacities in Westford's government since 1991. And that's the same year our chair of the select board at the time, Miles Jensen, first began corresponding with an agency of natural resources on uh, the need for Westford to have a municipal wastewater system. So we've, we've traveled a long, a long road. Um, it began in earnest with our, one of our first miniature planning grants in the early 90s. We teamed up with um, a Montpelier uh, engineering group, um, Stone Environmental, and um, hired them to locate and uh, inventory any suitable soils in our town common area. Uh, the study proved very discouraging. There were only a few small areas with potential all requiring pretreatment. Six years later, we again secured another small grant to explore those areas. And we began working on a plan to handle our four public buildings in our Are village. Are you talking about a septic based system? This is a, this is a wastewater system, ma'am, yes. Um, okay, so, but it would be a municipal septic system, not the kind of water treatment facilities that larger communities have. Correct. The big tanks and the mixers and- This is actually what I'm getting to is how we evolved into a com conventional soil-based system. Okay. Um, I just wanted to demonstrate our need for it. Um, we are like typical Vermont villages located next to a water resource with unsuitable soils. Our four public buildings all have compromised or questionable systems. An example is our town office. The leach field is under the parking lot and it's mm -hmm. shared with an adjacent property there's no possible location for a replacement and it's over 50 years old. So we have a real situation. And parallel to these wastewater issues, we've been trying to advance our economic development plans in other ways. We've um, gotten together and had numerous um, public surveys and public outreaches during events like 4th of July, common, that sort of thing. And we've learned that there's a huge desire in Westford to preserve its rural character and to create a vibrant downtown village that felt central to our community. And I'm not describing random commercial development. It's a village center that offers essential services like a store, a post office, a cafe, places to connect with neighbors. Uh, we learned a lot, the outreach was rewarding, and it, it feels like a true unified community goal. Unfortunately, all the while, as we're slowly working towards creating this community vision, 
our population in Westford is declining. Our young people are all leaving, unable to afford a home or land or the taxes. Um, we simply don't have the grand list to support wastewater without using a project TIF as well. Um, so where we are right now is, and just to give you a list of the stuff that we've accomplished, is in 2015, we achieved a village center designation. In 2016, we adopted form-based code in our village town common area. That way we can control our streetscape. We also require two-story buildings. The idea is that there would be commercial on the bottom, residential on the top, uh, mixed use. Uh, there's no density cap. Um, we have streamlined the application process, making it very applicant friendly. Um, also in 2006, a large parcel adjacent to our town common came up for sale and this had unbelievable suitable soils. And, and it was a huge undertaking for us um, with a lot of public effort, a lot of volunteers combined, combined with private donors, the Vermont Land Trust and the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, we were able to finally purchase and conserve this 130 acre property um, for recreation use and our municipal wastewater. This property allows us to put in a very simple conventional system that will serve our entire village with considerable expansion. In 2019, we achieved neighborhood development designation. And I believe Westford is the smallest Vermont town to receive this designation. Again, the idea is to make it easy for development. Um, the Act 250 issue, I'm an Act 250 veteran, I wear the scars, uh, is, is um, relieved. So that means there's a, a quicker application process time. Uh, it's more inviting. Uh, to various um, developers, et cetera. Um, also very important last year in 2019, the cornerstone property of our village town common area came up for sale. This was the old Pigeons bus garage, just approximately 3.2 acres. Um, and it abuts our town, uh, it's adjacent to our town office. Um, it's uh, across from our town common. It's just a really beautiful piece of property, perfect for mixed use development and affordable housing. The property location also offers us solutions to our stormwater management in our village and public access to the Browns River in a really ideal spot. And this was a very popular survey request from residents. So another, another way for us to ease, to make it easier for us to gain public support with this project. Um, and it was shortly after that, that we learned of the project TIF. Um, I personally headed up the um, Planning Commission subcommittee to look into the feasibility of purchasing this property and combining it with the wastewater. And the results were very, very positive because instead of just bringing wastewater to our village, we were bringing real economic development with immediate payback. Um, at present, we're working with Green Mountain Engineering and Stone Environmental to complete our preliminary engineering report. And last week we submitted our step one application for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Uh, so we brought this to the goal line um, and we're well aware that it's gonna require more than the TIF, but the TIF is the most critical component. And I, I, I want you to understand that we're currently working on, on, on grant funding and securing development partners. However, without a tool like a, the proposed TIF, our community is unable to overcome the resulting funding gap. The reality is even with a 50% grant funding, our option to pay back a bonded loan is with increased property taxes and user fees. And it, it just doesn't work. Westford is much too small a community. Our projected costs at a 50% grant funding put the average user fee 
up to $1,000 per year for each village property. Our residents can't afford that. We wouldn't even bring it before the voters. Um, the advantages as a TIF have for our town are numerous and it would allow us to develop the 17 property almost with immediate return to the grand list. And once this property is connected to our village wastewater system, the limits on bedrooms and homes in the village area is immediately lifted. That means all the residential properties will be able to add bedrooms, additions, accessory apartments. It will really free up the, the potential to expand our grand list. Um, and in allowing for social, uh, I'm sorry, allowing for associated development throughout all of our village common. With available affordable housing, young people are most likely to stay and raise families in Westford. And this is a very important piece of our plan. I, I can tell you from personal experience, my wife and I own a business in Westford and we employ 30 people. During the COVID crisis, this pandemic, we lost every single one of our employees under 33 years old because they're all living at home. Now we have a profit sharing program and a 401k program that after a year you're eligible for. And one of the most popular things our HR person works with with these young people is saving up for their home. Okay. It's just not gonna happen if we can't use a tool or have access to a tool like TIFF. Um, I encourage you on the project tips to kindly make it simple, easy to manage for small towns uh, and think about the long-term <laughs> contribution it's going to make to the education fund. Cause I know there's an argument about that. I've, we've spoken to administrators in, in towns that you know have done large tips and the complication of large tips is absolutely beyond a small towns administration. We understand that. What we do understand is that Westford's population, its school population in general, it's, it's declining. And this, this investment in Westford will pay back. It, this will never happen without it. If, it. if it could have happened, believe me, it would have happened by now. I've been working so hard on this and other members of the committees have been for years now, with every option you can imagine. We've talked to every housing partner and every private contractor and anybody that can get involved with our town common, they all say the same thing. Great, real exciting. Let us know when you have wastewater. We have very convincing public response to predict that the majority of the commercial space and the housing we create in our TIF revitalization will be occupied by Westford residents. These are people that are commuting into Burlington and South Burlington and Essex and wherever. You know, that saves on our road infrastructures, but it, it helps build community in Westford. And I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Lister Attorney? Senator McDonald. So, um, Mr. Chair, I, I'm, Madam Chair, I'm trying to, is the town of Westford seeking to borrow money or to get a, uh, someone to subsidize their interest rates on bonds or what's the ask here? Well, I think we, we Senator Sorokin asked to have Mr. Letourney come first. And we haven't been through the details of these mini TIFs. So I think it might be helpful before we, he's asking us to pass the mini TIF bill. I think we need to go on to the other residents to understand the details of that bill. Okay. So and, in, the, so in the past, um, 
towns have gone went to the institutions committee to ask for appropriations to do such things, or they've got, done competitive grants to do such things, or they reached down and dug up the money to do such things, and they. I, I don't think this this is any different than many towns in the state. This who's where is the money to come from to help subsidize the interest rates or whatever it is that the that the the town is won't have to pay for itself in order to make this work okay i i think we'll go on to the next witnesses and that we will get that answer thank and you Chair. megan sullivan is next so megan Talk to Good us. afternoon, committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Megan Sullivan, Executive Director of the uh, Vermont Economic Progress Council. Um, I really appreciate, Mark, you coming in and talking about Westford's story. Um, so what we found and, and some feedback that I got last year when talking um, just generally about, about the TIF program um, from uh, legislators in rural areas is, is that the TIF program works great for our regional hubs. Um, and it's right. done some incredible things. If you look at what's happened in St. Albans, if you look at the um, Renaissance in Winooski, um, what's happened in, in Hartford, there's, it tells a great story of how this um, tool can be used by a large community um, to be community driven um, place making change. Um, but the program for districts is, is more than what our small communities need. Um, both from the administrative side and from the scope size. If you ask a town like Westford to bring us 10 years worth of projects that are going to amount to tens of millions of dollars, um, the capacity for planning and for execution um, for a lot of our small communities just isn't there. But that doesn't mean that these communities don't have a desire to have that sense of place to turn their village center into a center. If you, if you drive through Westford now where their village center is, you can see there's a common green, um, but there's not much else around it that really gives that sense of this is where our community comes together. Um, and I think even more so now in light of COVID-19 that, that folks are going to be looking in those rural areas for that small town experience where they can't necessarily be in large gatherings, they can still come together in smaller communities. Um, and our communities need to have the infrastructure there to provide for the private development um, to come in and provide the resources that create that village um, center. So what we are proposing is a alternative to the district program. And I say an alternative because our districts um, would not be eligible to participate in this project-based um, economic development program where a community would identify a single project, whether it's wastewater coming into their village center, whether it's a brownfield remediation that will um, clean up a site in their downtown to allow for development, whether it's a transportation enhancement, um, a single project where a very limited number of parcels are identified. So another difference between the district program and the project-based program is that we're looking at instead of between 100 to 500 parcels, um, it would be up to 10 parcels um, would be identified as where the expected development will happen. And it would need to be in a designated area, um, either in a designated downtown or a village center um, or in a uh, industrial park. And the um, tax increment from those few parcels that come from the private development after the public infrastructure is finished would be used as the gap financing. So um, Faith, I don't know if you can pull up the document I sent. There it goes. Thank you. Can you scroll down? Um, so there's, there's text there to really tell the story. Um, but what we're looking at um, for this project is that the communities are, are working hard to identify how to get these projects over the finish line. Um, so in our, our example of Westford, um, 
you know, they've looked at the state revolving loan fund, they've identified um, cost, part of that cost um, to bring it, or part of that fund to bring down the cost. They've identified money from the Northern Border Regional Commission um, and other sources of capital are still needed. So they're gonna have to go to their voters and bond. But as, as Mark was saying, there's a certain level of bond capacity that voters can take on. Um, and what is left over is too high. Um, and I know we had the town manager from Highgate um, speak at the, the governor's press conference on this, that they tried to bring the large bond to their, to their voters and the voters said, no, they can't afford it. Um, so what this tool would do is look at what the gap is, what's left over, what can the voters afford, what can we get out of grants, and that percentage that's remaining, um, if we isolate a few parcels where the increment can be used um, to repay um, that financing, then this project can get over the finish line. In Westford's case, it's a project that was their first priority in 1991 um, and has not been able to come to fruition yet. Um, and then the added benefit there is um, that you now have a wastewater system that is serving so many parcels outside of these few that have been isolated for um, the financing that can benefit. And with those parcels going, uh, the increment from property um, growth in those parcels going directly to the municipal and the education fund, you have um, robust um, benefits from that system that I think really um, challenge the question of, is this costing the Ed Fund? I mean, I think this project wouldn't happen anyways. It hasn't happened for 30 years. And if it does happen, there will be other benefits that the Education Fund and the Municipal Fund will see um, in the areas outside of these few parcels that are being um, identified here. So that's the, the gist of, of what we're proposing. Faith, if you wanna scroll down, I can um, show a little bit more of how, how it looks. So um, in the example above of where we show the different costs, um, that user fee um, of $1,200 per user is, is out of reach. Um, but if we can bring it down to 700 um, and then use that 67,000 of um, annual TIF costs, which would be paid with the increment that comes in um, and some of that coming from the education fund increment from the 75% because it would only similar to the TIF district program, it would be a 75-25 split, um, or I'm sorry, a 70-30 split and 85% of the municipal increment going in, um, that project suddenly um, becomes viable. And if you go further down, Faith. So this shows you how that works. So that original taxable value is frozen. Um, so the education fund will never get less than their the original taxable value plus 30% of the increment and then 70% of the municipal fund increment and 85 or more percent of the municipal increment um, until um, the retention periods ends, which would be up to 20 years. Now, if, if the increment was coming in and they were able to pay off the debt um, faster, then it would end faster. Um, because unlike the district program, this is one project. There is only one incurrence of debt. You're only, you know, there's one bite at the apple. And that gets to how we deal with the administrative piece of this. Um, I think a lot of the complication in TIF districts come from the fact that you have three or four projects going on at once. You have multiple debts um, that have been incurred and you really have to um, do a lot of accounting and financing of where all those monies are going. Um, in this, we're looking at, you can only, incurred debt once, um, you're paying your related costs and your improvement costs um, for the project, and then you're just paying debt service. Um, so within the smaller scope, it immediately becomes um, much more simplified. What happens if the development doesn't happen? Or that if the increment isn't 
what it's anticipated. If it doesn't happen, those same taxpayers, I believe, are still on the hook. Are right? on the hook. They are on the hook. Um, I think, you know, one way that this, the, so the taxpayers are still on the hook. One way that this is addressed is that because you're going for one project, you're not going to come for approval from VEPSI until you have this project pretty well lined up, until you know what that gap is. Um, and you're gonna move forward with that knowledge um, of here's what the development's gonna be. We know what our increment is gonna look like. We know where the gap is. Um, and that's, it's going to be more solid than, you know, again, a 10-year plan where you're really looking out what is our long-term development um, plan. And, and that works well for our regional hubs, um, but our smaller communities, um, it's got to be that shorter time frame where we're really looking at the one project that they've been focused on for years, that they know what's going on. Um, and, you know, I think you also have a different type of developer. I know in uh, Middlesex, the Camp Mead property, you know, these are, um, these are folks who live and love that community people who, who want to see that area thrive. Um, and I think similar in, in Westford and, and other areas that we've talked to, it's, it's people who live locally that are the, this, that are the developers. Um, they have a commitment to doing um, development there, um, but you know, they, they can't take on that public infrastructure piece themselves. Okay, is the public infrastructure essentially wastewater? Not necessarily. So for, you know, the, the Middlesex project, it's um, transportation enhancements. In, in West Rutland, it's similarly a transportation enhancement that they can't have um, this senior- We have transportation enhancement grants though. Right, you do. But there's the gap. That's why this isn't, this isn't um, TIF in the same way that the district TIF is where you're paying for the full, pro full project. Um, there are a lot of grants or um, whether federal or state have match requirements. Mm -hmm. And if you have to match between 50 or 20%, um, coming up with that match in small communities can be incredibly challenging. Um, this allows communities to leverage those local funds. Northern Border Regional Commission funds require between 20 and 50% match. Um, it's, it can be very difficult for small communities who have projects that are um, just as valuable as larger communities to be able to figure out how to pull that off. Okay, Sandra Pearson. Uh, Megan, just to clarify what you mean by the gap um, is, is, are you talking about uh, because there's the short term um, increase to the local, what the municipality gets to hold? Is that, is that what you're talking about? Just, maybe just describe it. Sure. Right. So it's, so if it's a $2 million project and you, someone's identified a million dollars worth of grants. Um, and at some point there's, you know, there's the, the match that's required that you can't um, necessarily match more federal money with more federal money with more federal money. So you've, you've gotten all of the grants you can get. It's a $2 million project. You've got a million dollars um, and you're saying, we know that our small community, um, whether it's, you know, if it's wastewater, our, our user rates, um, if it's, um, Brownfield or transportation, if it's a general obligation bond, um, you know, we can take on $500,000 worth of debt. Our community can support up to this level. That leaves a $500,000 gap in getting this project over the finish line um, that can stall a project for years. Um, so this is looking at using the increment from the, the parcels that have been identified for private development, no more than 10 parcels, um, that can fill that, that, the increment that can fill that gap in financing. Okay. Okay. So this is really tips which were originally set up to 
redevelop and revitalize downtown districts that had fallen into disuse and disrepair. It's part of the re undoing urban flight. This is saying there's towns that could develop, but for a water plant for water, wastewater right. or something. But we're making them a loan from the education fund. I know Senator McDonald. Um, we're from the education them, fund. From the ed fund. That's oh, I mean, only up, if... rather than setting up another form. I mean, we have a revolving loan fund for wastewater. We used to have federal grants for wastewater plants. Um, we now have a revolving loan fund. We used to have the Delhi section in the Capitol bill, um, but I've never heard, yeah, I, th this is definitely, it's loaning money without loaning money. And can I get some from you, Madam Chair, on that basis? Can you what? No, you I don't have some any. money without me actually having to. Yeah, it, no. It's I only loaning money if you think that this would have happened anyways. And, I, you know, I think if if you look at the letter um, from Westford from 1991 that says this wastewater is our number one priority to do economic yeah. development in our village center. And it hasn't happened. And there has not been economic development in their village center. Yep. It, it's, there's no, there's no uh, question, I think, about a but for in this situation, but for a tool that helps them close that gap, they can't get there. And without this development, the education fund is not gonna see um, even that 30% increase that they would see let alone the benefits that will come from all of the other properties that now have wastewater capabilities that can add additions, that can um, add housing um, that would not have happened otherwise. I think that's the other piece of this is that because it's such a small, um, it is that gap financing, we're only freezing a few parcels. The other parcels that um, can be developed because of this 100% of the increment will be going straight into the funds. Okay. But so, if- Madam Chair. Okay, no, but let me finish. Okay, yeah. then you can have apoplexy. The, um, cause normally I might like this, but for the $166 billion deficit in the Ed Fund, um, we don't have any money to loan. But are you saying that you're gonna take these the, the building they want to put a restaurant and some apartments in. Now you also understand by the previous bill, you're going to be required if you have multifamily zoning to put in eighth of an acre zoning, which you may or may not like um, once you have a public wastewater system. But are you saying, because you are within commuting distance of Chittenden County, the one or in Chittenden County, the one major growth area, I believe. Um, are you saying that other developers could come in, hook up to your wastewater system plant and benefit from so we could end up being supplying wastewater for some fairly high-end homes? I mean, could, is that part of what could happen with this? That it's not, this infrastructure isn't limited to your downtown core, that it could, you could hook up other development to it. Um, our village area is, um, it's relatively small, our town common zoning district. Um, larger homes seem to be more popular on larger parcels. Uh, we don't have any large homes in our village center area. 
we are um, talking to another developer who would like to also develop property in the in the village district area of uh, the town common area and he is talking about smaller affordable homes as well um, it seems to work better in that village environment i'm so I, personally i'm not aware of anyone entertaining the idea of building larger luxury homes or right but you're building homes and will he be asked to contribute to the cost of the building the filtration plant or the um, wastewater plant? Well, there'll, there'll be a um, connection fee um, and uh, there will be a user fee. Uh, the idea is that both these fees will be economical enough for normal families to be able to afford. Nothing special for, I'm just thinking of the Act 250 model where if I'm putting something in the next town, I've got to pay for traffic improvements in the surrounding area. If I'm going to be able to put in a development, it seems like traditionally I would have been asked to make a contribution to the cost of the public infrastructure necessary for that uh, that development, um, that's that's usually what happens in a planned residential development in Westford as well. You know, as far as uh, the actual infrastructure, particular to that development, yeah. yes, that's that's all pretty much standard development policy for our town as well. And I think what so so the village center for Westford is larger than these few parcels that have been identified for. Um, real development. And I think that gets to the question of what if the development doesn't happen? So these are the, these are the parcels where um, Westford has said there are developers who are interested who have said without wastewater, we can't do this. Without wastewater, we can't yeah. put housing on upper floors. We can't um, do X, Y, and Z. But once it's there and once those few parcels are developed and this community starts to show a village center, I mean, that sparks the growth of of other folks who want to become part of that, that now have the infrastructure in place. Um, you know, I think that's that's part of the purpose of TIF, um, regardless if you're talking about project-based or district-based, but that, that, that benefit and that um, um, development um, improvement really generates more interest in the area. Okay, no, I, I, I'm not arguing that. Well, and I think it's important also. Any other questions? Senator McDonald, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, it, it, Madam Chair, in the beginning, um, this was something that was going to be good for the small town. And at the end of the presentation, it was something that the Ed Fund should be delighted to have because it was going to help the Ed Fund. If that were the case, um, the banks would be in elbowing the Ed Fund out of the way to get the business. Um, and they're not. So I'm missing something here. Um, it, who, is the, who is the person who stands in place of the bank loan officer that approves these applications in this, in this bill? Is that what um, that, Vep Vepsi, Vepsi does? would be the approval for the um, for the applicant for the TIF funds, and we'd look at just like in the in the current TIF program, we'd looked at vi viability of a project at the development yep. that's being proposed and the increment. Um, so it would be a, it would be a similar application process, though a much smaller right. scope. Um, and if, but in a bank, if you approve of such a thing and you make a mistake then that's on the the, the banks um the bank takes the hit isn't that right I, what yeah. what is the what if what's Pepsi's skin in this game as the um as the people who are making the loan or are they someone else making the loan and they're just well it's okay the, it? it's this the town has puts the full faith and credit of the municipality behind the um, 
the bond or the debt incurrence. In which case they should be able to get it from the bank, should they not? If it's, uh, uh, what, why is, why is the bank not recognizing okay. what you, you're proposing as the, uh, to be as wonderful and profitable and beneficial as you have, you and, and the gentleman is, from is the question, Westwood have, have said it is. All right, it's the question, and it's probably not fair to just pick on Westford. Is, no, I, I'm, we've got we've got a certain it, amount of grant money. We got twenty four more. We, we've got a gap. We got twenty four. Right. There's twenty five of these things total, and I'm yes. trying to 15. understand where the money's coming from. Okay, there's up to, to fill fifteen this gap. with a limit of is it fifteen million? Eight, no, six, five five million a piece. It it came out to about twenty million dollar risk. Um, total to the Ed Fund, as I as I remember initially, I think Senator McDonald's question is, why can't the towns, if this is such a good deal, why can't the towns go to the bank and take out a loan and pay the loan back with the increase in the grand list? So the increase in the grand list doesn't happen but for this project. And yeah. at the way that the property taxes in Vermont are divided, just using a municipal increment is not going to, to close the gap. You can't get the votes for it. Is that No, no, uh, the municipal, the, I, yeah. I'm assuming yeah. that the municipal budget in the town in any town, generally it's one third of the school budget. Right. So you're saying that the town's increment is not enough Munis right. to Municipal TIF the, currently exists. Yes, so the municipal the TIF program currently exists in state statute. I'm not right. aware of anyone who has set one up. A municipal TIF? Yeah. Oh. All tips were municipal when they were the law first passed. Okay, sure. Senator Brock has a question. To answer, I think, uh, uh, Senator McDonald's question is that a private lender cannot come in to cover the gap because the funding source under the tips that would be used to repay the lender would then go to the taxes. It would not be able and would not be available to be paid back to the private lender. That's why they can't go to the bank to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Megan, do you have anything else at this point? Um, uh, so I would Jeff just say that this is, you know, this, this was a priority of the administration before COVID-19 and it remains- I was gonna say, we've got BV, so. It, it remains a priority, um, especially as we're looking at our village centers and our downtowns trying to, to reimagine and, um, um, and recover that, that we need all of the tools we can get um, to get communities there. And, and that gap um, existed before and it will continue to exist. Um, and I think our small, our small communities, we've you know, we've put a priority on downtowns and village centers um, and giving our village centers the chance to, to become you know, what, what they wanna be and a, a place um, for their community um, is still a priority. Okay, Senator Pearson. Thank you, Megan, uh, we've covered Westford and you said there was a few other towns mm -hmm. interested, West Rutland maybe. Um, what? Remind us in the bill, there's a limit on, is there a limit on the number of towns or just on the money? Mm -hmm. towns. So Senate Economic Development put a limit on both of those, uh, a limit on five per year. Um, and that each, I think 1.5 million in total. Um, that's that's not necessarily our proposal, but that's that's what was passed out of Senate Economic Development. And then how many communities are you aware of that would are exploring this uh, uh, right now? Um, so we have had conversations with um, 
Westford, West Rutland, um, um, Johnson, um, Highgate, uh, Middlesex. Um, so we know that there is there's interest, um, and then we've heard, um, you know, anecdotally from from other folks who are intrigued and want to wait to see what happens. Um, I think it's one of those one of those things where we can't ask towns to spend too much time doing the amount of um, projections that Westford has done. Um, if it doesn't go anywhere, that's, you know, there's staff time involved. And it is 15 projects at 1.5 million. I knew I came right. up with but that. But five per through. year. Yeah. You know, and I think for, for the, the 1.5, um, I, I think that could be a little challenging, I, you know, if there's a way to not include the municipal increment in that so that there is some flexibility for um, projects when you're looking at the, the related costs um, that come along with projects. Um, a little more flexibility there would be would be great, but um, I think, you know, I th think the ability to get this program off the ground and and um, work with some communities through a pilot program like this um, would be a great opportunity. Okay, we were just talking about downtown tax credits. Can these towns not use downtown tax credits? Um, I don't have regs in front of me, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't have. And that's not in your is, area. Well, maybe we'll move Chris on to Joe and let well, this her have Chris some Parker. of this fun. And um, Joan, maybe you can talk to I, us uh, about. Well, I was just going to say, uh, if um, if you're talking about a public uh, project, uh, you know, the public infrastructure, the tax credit is really more for the private property owner. Yeah. This is Chris Cochran here. Well, the tax credits can only support um, yeah. rehab of existing buildings. It doesn't support new buildings. And it only goes for the building improvements. It doesn't go for the underground utility okay. and infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, Joan, back to you. Okay. Um, what would you like me to focus on? Uh, I think... Uh, I, th I think what we're all... There is this program. Right. And merits and or dismerits, and the committee may vary on. Um, I have always been a supporter of TIFs. I think I put in the original TIF legislation. I am struggling with a hundred and sixty-six million dollar deficit in the Ed Fund, mm -hmm. and the timing of this. Um, the looking at additional costs that that we're all looking at, and I think that's it's the timing. Um, and in the past, we if we wanted to help towns put up, in, you know, infrastructure, and especially wastewater infrastructure, clean water infrastructure. We've had grants and loans. And we're suddenly going to the Ed Fund for a grant or a lo I guess it's a loan. Um, so and this yeah, yeah and this is not redevelopment. It's it's you know the downtown tax credits are limited to redevelopment. This is new development. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think that that's, I, we're just, mm -hmm. I'm just looking for the, the, at this point in time, the right. rationale for doing this. So I think uh, what we've had to do in, 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 its, in our entirety is to sort of look at what our original asks were and figure out whether or not those help with recovery. And what we've come to is that clearly mini TIF does because the situation is dire, right? We know that the economy is hurting, but we can't neglect the idea of trying to incentivize and plant seeds for additional investment into these towns, especially the smaller the town. 
So even though we have grants and loans and all kinds of activities available to municipalities, we all know that there are small municipalities that cannot meet the gap and this will help meet that gap. So I know that we're struggling with the idea of additional costs, but I think that that analogy would be relevant if, the, if we felt that the, you know, the total amount possibly to be collected stays the same. I think in this case, we're raising that ceiling. We are saying that there's incremental um, property valuation that would, you know, that increment will pay back that debt. If we are considering it that that project would happen anyway, then I could see it being considered a cost. But I think it's fair to say that in some these towns, this has not happened. I know my own little town, like we've got like a sewer system that serves a hundred users. If they have to do any project, uh, the amount of user fee would just be prohibited. So I think this came about with the critique that the current TIF system only helps large uh, cities, larger cities and towns in Vermont. And we needed something and a tool to help rural economic development and to help all the towns and villages of, of Vermont and not have these tools that take so much sophistication level that you need professional staff and all the rest of it. I mean, when we know lots of towns are working with um, sort of minimal professional staff, but having said that in order for them to survive and thrive, and have economic development, they will need some infrastructure improvements. So I think if we look at it in the context of long-term recovery, we would understand that we're not risking, there's almost like the risk of doing nothing is probably greater than the risk of allowing these districts to occur and to encourage incremental, um, to encourage additional investment that we so sorely need. And even though it was a pre-COVID ask, post-COVID, it's still extremely relevant. Okay, so how did your town of 100 users put in a, a septic so, system? So they, so what's happened is they, ha so way back when, I guess in the 70s, there must have been some federal grant that came in that lots of little towns were able to yeah, put we, in some yeah. sort of um, wastewater system. And yes. they did this wastewater well, system, right, of 100 users. And what happened is they didn't, they didn't, um, put into consideration the maintenance and everything that was necessary. And so our, to our village had to go into debt to, to just do the kind of maintenance, not even expansion. Uh, expansion would take on a whole other um, ball of wax. I'm not sure we would have enough to actually, you know, even contemplate that. But for towns and villages that have done the work to figure out that there would be additional private investment that could help um, kind of grow their tax base. Um, you know, they've done the work, they, they haven't had the development. And now more than ever, you know, the complexions of our downtown villages and, and, and town centers are, might be changed for, for a very long time as a result of COVID. So I think anything we could do to have more tools in the toolbox to encourage that level of investment would be helpful for Vermont. Okay, Senator Sorokin. Uh, just briefly, um, is there sort of a pro- Can't hear you, Michael. Uh, Megan, is there like a pro forma you could chart out for us using Westford as an example of how much the Ed Fund would suffer if there's no resulting development and how much would it would gain if in three years there's the full development that we anticipate and maybe some example somewhere in between can we see the dollar figures i mean people are concerned i happen to be a big fan of tiffs as well i think we should use this creative financing to grow our economy but i'd like to for the people who are so concerned that the ed fund is going to lose money here can we see the worst case and the best case scenarios as to how much it's going to cost the ed fund because i have a feeling even in the worst case scenario we're not talking about very much money. Uh, maybe it multiplies several times over five years of this pilot, uh, but at least using Westford as an example, I mean, I assume this is what you do when you approve these grants. And I know we saw it from Burlington when they came in and said, this is how much we're gonna yield in a, in a gain right. from the Ed Fund. Can you do this, do that yeah. in quick order for us? Yeah, we've, I mean, we've done, um, 
in that handout, we've done some of the modeling. So we've already done some of it of what the increment will look like based on the property value increase projections, what the increment will look like on the um, education fund side and on the municipal side that will go into paying for this. Um, so we have those numbers and- um, But show us- show Projecting us, what- Okay, oh, yeah. Show us a bad case scenario. Okay. Not only a good case, show us a bad case scenario. I am sure uh, Ken Jones will be able to whip that up for us. Um, but I, and I do want to clarify that this this tool is for redevelopment. Um, you know, the Camp Mead properties, it is it, for in Middlesex. You know, looking at the redevelopment of those um, those buildings um, into a new community center. Um, so it's there may be some some areas in the village center um, in our Westford example that would be, you know, taking one parcel and, and making it into uh, a few parcels to develop. But uh, largely, I think our village centers would be looking at redevelopment opportunities. Okay, is this is Middlesex applying as a town or I know there's a group that's interested in. It, the applicant would be Middlesex the town for um, for improvements um, okay. in order to allow for that that development, um, the developers that are there um, to move forward with the development they're projecting because they they can't move forward with that project without things like um, traffic easing um, solutions and um, sidewalks and crosswalks and and parking to make that an area that people can can visit. Um, okay. I mean the other the other major so. state route, so they should be eligible for some transportation enhancement grants. Right. And they, I'm and sure they will thing, be. I mean, Morning. Camp Mead yeah. is an old. I don't know if it was ever an army camp or it was just it belonged to the guy who collected army vehicles, and they're using it right. kind of as an artsy area right now. But I'm not sure how it would lend it, unless we're just talking about expansion area for businesses that are there. The biggest of which is Red Hand Bakery, which has right. expanded uh, greatly. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to to have the okay. those folks get in touch to because they they um, gave a presentation to House Commerce as well about what okay. what it is they're thinking, but what they what the public infrastructure needs are in order to make that happen. Okay, Senator Ballant. So I just want to be clear that um, this was a strong vote on, on this out of economic development. So the chair does, you know, he speaks for the group. We really feel like this is a tool for, for rural areas. And I do think that we need to see the data that it feels like we talk about this over and over and it starts feeling like a red herring. Let's see the numbers and let's, do something for these smaller towns. Okay. Joan, do you have anything else to add at this point? No, I don't. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to go on to Karen Horn because we've got two more bills to go through and some of us have a five o'clock meeting, um, which will probably be fairly long. So Karen, Thank you, Senator, and um, I promised to be very brief, so I, I will be Karen Horn with the League of Cities and Towns. We had supported this before um, the COVID crisis got rolling. We are very understanding of the issues with the education fund deficit right now. We're um, sort of in the crosshairs on that whole issue. Um, so we certainly understand that. The one thing I would want to say with respect to these incentives is that we really need to be ready for efforts to regenerate our local economies when we move beyond the COVID-19 crisis. We're looking at, and I'm sure you can see it in all of your downtowns, um, really pretty dire straits with our small businesses. Um, and uh, even with things like parking meter revenues and, uh, and stuff like that. So um, we are going to have to rebuild. It's going to take some time and a considerable amount of effort in a whole new world. 
and um, we're going to need some incentives um, and programs that are nimble and able to help make that happen. Okay. Committee, any other questions at this point? Plenty, right. but I won't ask them right now. Okay. I think we've got, there's a division on the merits, maybe not that big a division, and then on the, the timing, um, which will be something to be worked out. Okay. All right. So I'm going to take a...